Welcome to the Manitoba Ag Days podcast, where we hear from some of the most relevant, up-to-date, informational speakers in our industry. In episode 18, Darren Bond, a farm management specialist at Manitoba Agriculture, tells his story. Time to step up your grain game. Good morning, everyone. My, my name's Darren Bond, farm management specialist, Manitoba Agriculture, out of Toulon, just north Winnipeg. Just wanted to thank you for attending the morning session on crop economics, uh, how to grow your grain game. That's the title that they, they told me. So they said crop economics is too boring. So I said, yep, yeah, sure, that sounds good. We'll, we'll go with that. Uh, just a few reminders. First of all, uh, please turn your cell phones to vibrate. If there's a call, uh, could you please step outside to take it? And for the agronomy sessions, there are CCA credits uh, available. So make sure if you're interested in that, you sign up for that. So my presentation today is on crop economics. And what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about, uh, look back at, at 2017 to see how our crops performed, both in terms of yield, price, but most importantly, net returns. And we're going to talk about the 2018 projections for what we see coming forward uh, in, the, uh, in the near future here. We're going to talk about analytics, how to compare different crops amongst each other, and then once the, the cedar is in the ground and, and things are rolling, how to make decisions with analytics and your numbers is to make sure that you can wring as much profit out of those crops. And then we're going to tie it up with a discussion on land rent, probably one of the most uh, most requested uh, calls and topics that I receive and that my colleagues receive uh, throughout the province uh, about how much should I be paying for land rent. So I, I, I'm really impressed with today's farmers. We've really moved, uh, moved a long uh, distance. We've really stepped up our capacity for management and, and now it's not so much what are your numbers, it's more about what can we do with these numbers once we have them. Obviously, knowing your own numbers is key to all this. The value in what I'm going to give to you today isn't so much the numbers that I have, it's more the logic model or the method, the process to take in your own numbers, assess your own numbers, and apply your management skills to those numbers to make the best decisions on your farm. We've really been touting, know your cost per bushel sold. We're often stuck in the cost per acre mindset. Uh, at the end of the day, we sell bushels, we sell tons, we sell pounds. What we should be doing as producers is figuring out what our costs are on a bushel sold basis. And we'll be talking about that today. And lastly, of course, every year is different. Weather is different, market's different. Everything is, is changes, and what I say today might be different tomorrow, a week from now, uh, six months from now. But at the end of the day, the most profitable farmers are profitable consistently, and it doesn't happen by accident. You have to plan for it. This is the guide that all, all of our numbers are in today that we'll be talking about. Our booth is in the curling rink, so please uh, stop by. These guides are free. Pick one up. Uh, we'd like love to see you uh, there, and I'll be there this afternoon. So if you want to have a chat, by all means, go ahead. Also, this presentation, along with this document, is online. Uh, Google search it, Manitoba Egg Production Cost. That's the easiest way to, to find it. Uh, it'll lead you right there to the Production Economics page. And this presentation is in PDF form, uh, so you can go there right now, download it onto your phone, and follow along. Keep it for another time or reference it later on uh, down the road. So it allows you to have that as a, as a take home and, and something that you can use on a go forward basis. So let's look back. Where, where were the acres this past year? And this data you see on the screen here is 2017 MASD seeded acreage data. Obviously, the big three crops hard red spring wheat, soybeans, and canola are the big three and account for nearly 80% of the crops grown in this past year. 
Other trends that we're seeing, oats and uh, corn account for about 9% of the crops that are grown. So a lot of our discussion today is going to be focusing on the big three. It's not to take away from the other crops and, and the, the diversification crops that we've seen grown. But at the end of the day, this is a really good way to view where where our acres and, and producers have voted with their cedar, obviously, with these big three crops. These are the balance of the, the remaining acres that, that other 7% that you've seen. Uh, obviously, one draw here to, to pull out is the hard northern uh, wheat is, is growing in popularity as well. Prices. So where have our prices been? The, the charts that you'll see here are the 2016-17 weekly close. So you may see, you may, or you may have generated some higher returns, to some, some higher prices per bushel uh, throughout the season or the crop year last year. This is just a weekly close. And obviously what we've seen here, uh, we saw the weather rally in July uh, with dryness concerns into the state. What, what I really found interesting was that with the price range of Five sixty eight sixty five. That was a three dollar, just over three dollar bushel price swing, or fifty five percent. I remember. I'm going to date myself here. I remember back in the day when when five ten cents per bushel swing caused heart attacks in the coffee shops. Now it's, it just seems like these swings are huge, and we as producers have to manage our risk, which is something we're going to talk about today. But I, I think this chart here just shows what what type of swings we do have within our commodities. This next one here is canola, again, 2016-17 crop year, weekly close. Uh, average price here was $11 throughout that year. And with that one, we saw a 25% swing from the highs and lows of the weekly close. Again, big swings and risk and causing, uh, causing some stress with our marketing plans and Definitely, when we, we have that stress, knowing the cost of production, knowing our base fundamentals become that much more important. Finally, closing with soybean crop year, 2016-17. A um, 20% price swing in this past crop year. Uh, again, we've seen, we've seen pretty decent prices, pretty decent returns, but again, we're, we still are subject to those swings. Last price slide we have here is the five-year average for all three crops. Um, the purple line, hard red spring wheat, ranged from 435 to 865 a bushel on average, just under 640 a bushel. With canola, the black line, we're at 808 to 1498. We have those high years uh, captured within the beginning part of this this chart uh, on average 1085 a bushel. Lastly, soybeans being the red line, 817 to 416 a bushel throughout that range, on average just over 11 bucks a bushel. Uh, one of the things that I've seen in this is the last few years has been relatively steady within the crop pricing, but again, year over year, we do have the swings and we do have those, uh, those highs and those lows that we have to be aware of. So, last slide on looking back in 2017. What was 2017 like? Well, for the most part throughout the province, there were some pretty good yields, namely in hard red spring wheat and canola. Hard red spring wheat was 66 bushels an acre, according to MASD, uh, which was a record, and canola was 47 bushels an acre, uh, which again was another record. And we can see, obviously, that those high yields have propelled those crops to being the most profitable. Uh, on, on your left, the, the most profitable crops are found on your left uh, with, uh, with um, canola and red spring wheat uh, leading the pack with that. Uh, winter wheat suffered, uh, suffered some yield uh, problems. Uh, obviously, we heard about that last spring. And barley, even though it tied its record yield in 82 bushels an acre, uh, turned a loss according to our yield and price data and using uh, the province's cost of production data. So, so 
Canola still still can build the farm, and it's uh, we again we see with those acres that canola is still a very popular choice. So now the projection. What, what's 2018 going to be? Good, the bad, the ugly. I I don't have a crystal ball here. Um, if I did, I'd be uh, rich on the beach in Mexico somewhere, selling my uh, secrets to success on the internet. Uh, but as my grandfather said, the best way to get rich is the old-fashioned way and just turn a steady profit year over year over year. And that's, that's the, the best and the best, least stressful way to do it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Climate patterns, what Trump's going to say next, what he's going to tweet, tweet about, NAFTA, all these things caused a lot of stress. And, and obviously in those price slides, we've seen some of that influence uh, affect those prices. So again, marketing plan is a big part of this, but before you get to that marketing plan, having your cost of production and, and knowing and keeping on top of them is, is crucial and it's huge as we move forward. We're going to start with fertilizer. Um, we, we have a lot of discussions uh, about price versus cost, uh, expense versus investment, you know, price versus cost. Price is what they're charging, cost is what you have to pay or what it actually costs you to, to obtain something. Um, the, you'll see at the, one of the questions there, is it cheaper to buy in fall and spring? There's a few slides about that. Generally, we, we see it a bit cheaper in the previous fall. And is it really cheaper in the long run to be chasing for that uh, last penny saved on the price? Uh, what's the cost at the end of the day in doing that? So I, I think that's important questions that we ask ourselves. Uh, the last point I want to uh, make about this, and, and fertilizer can be lumped in with seed. It can be lumped in with fungicide chemicals. Um, Expense versus investment. These crop inputs are an investment. Investments return a value to you over and above what you spend. Hopefully, anyways, with, 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 uh, with average uh, weather, that's what we usually get. And that's what we expect to see. Uh, expense is a little bit different. Expe expense is about fuel. It's about equipment costs. And unfortunately, when profitability comes under fire and, and is in jeopardy, producers cut the expense first. Our producers cut the investment first and the expense second. And it should be the other way around. We should, be, we should be making sure that we're still investing everything that we can into our crop because at the end of the day, that's what we're selling. We're selling pounds, bushels, tons. And it's important to remember that. Moving on to fertilizer. The slides that you see up here are the average urea prices. We see in the red is the previous fall. The blue is the, is the uh, spring. Obviously, uh, our trends for the surveys we've conducted have shown that the previous fall is cheaper, but we are starting to see those gaps narrow over time. So it's, it's important to realize that, but I, I, I think everybody is in agreement that generally it's the, the earlier you can purchase a fertilizer, uh, generally the cheaper it is. Uh, there have been some anomalies in years past, but for the most part that, that does hold. And obviously when you get into spring purchase fertilizer and the rush and the congestion, you're at mercy for making those purchases. So we still do see an, an average uh, gain in purchasing it in the previous fall. This next slide is the phosphate prices. Again, the same logic holds true. The previous fall is generally cheaper than the spring. But again, we start to see that the, the gap has narrowed over time. These gaps, when we first started, uh, or when I first started doing these presentations five, six years ago, the gaps were quite wide between the previous fall and the spring. We have seen them narrow. A big function of that, obviously, is the time value of money and the cost of storage, but we still see that, that benefit in the previous fall. Okay, so for our, our numbers that we're using today, the numbers that are in the guides that we have, um, we're going to be using uh, target yields. So our target yields, how we 
calculate our target yields is we take the probable yield, add 5% to it, and round it. So today uh, we're using 40 bushel canola and soybeans, 55 bushel hard red spring, 105 bushel oats, uh, 141 bushel corn, and 68 bushel hard northern wheat. Our prices, they look at them today, and I'm sure lots of you would say, okay, if I can get that price, I'll lock it in. Uh, these these uh, documents were printed at the beginning of December. Those were new crop prices at that time, uh, with canola at 11 and a quarter, soybeans 10.50, uh, hard red spring just under seven dollars. Uh, so we are basing our numbers on that. But just to give you uh, some idea of where prices are at today, we're looking at about a 50 cent a bushel uh, decrease from those prices today. So canola's around 10.70 for new crop. Uh, 10 buck beans, uh, 6.15 and 6.20 hard red spring wheat. So obviously, and you're going to hear this from me over and over again, it's important to know your numbers and continually update your numbers as time goes on because we start to see things change and we need to be on top of things from the costing side and the projection side to know where we stand with our crops. This is our projected operating cost for 2018, uh, ranging from three and a quarter to 500 bucks an acre. Uh, for the most part, we see a slow and steady increase in crop produ production costs from um, seed and chem. The big one over the last few years has been the price of equipment. Uh, that's reflected in fixed costs. Uh, obviously, the price of land is, has been a huge mover as well. But it's been a slow and steady increase, nothing dramatic with here, with, with these numbers. Uh, moving on, we see our crop profitability projections, again, using those numbers that we had previously. Uh, generally, the, uh, we range from, again, revenues 350, 450 uh, an acre on gross revenues. Uh, corn's just over 550. Um, what we are seeing is we are still seeing some profitability in these grains today. So, and even with the, the lower new crop prices, there is still some profitability to be had. Um, again, the, uh, the bigger or the higher profitable crops are on my left. And uh, canola, corn, and soybeans are still showing profitability. Now, I know soybeans, a lot of people... Uh, after the dryness last year, have some reservations about, about the crop. Uh, I don't think one poor year makes, makes or breaks a crop. I think we need a bit more time with that. But we are still seeing uh, soybeans to, to have some, some good profitability this year. Our break-even versus target yields, um, I, I think it's a, a good idea for everyone to, to determine their own break-even yields. Um, what we see here, canola, uh, the, the red is operating cost, blue is operating plus fixed. Uh, what we see here is canola, 34 bushels an acre, soybeans 28, uh, hard red spring just under 50 bushels an acre. Uh, the red line here is showing what our targets are to show how close we are to the line within our projections. However, if we use today's new crop prices, the numbers do worse than a little bit. Canola is just over 35 bushels an acre break even, uh, soybeans at 34, and hard red spring wheat just over 54 bushels. So we can see that that price difference does obviously uh, affect where our break even or projected break even yields are. Here is our price per unit or price per bushel sold. Again, I'm a big fan of doing this. I think this cuts through any of the uh, clutter and the cloudiness and the fog in determining how much yield there is and where your yields lie. Uh, some of the notable uh, ones here, um, we see canola at 9.45 a bushel, uh, soybeans at just over 8.50 a bushel, wheat just over six bucks a bushel, corn at 2.50 a bushel. So I think it's good to come up with our cost structure, determine what our cost per bushel sold is, and then it's a real quick and easy comparison to the prices that are offered. You can start to, to easily see where profits lie or where they don't lie. Um, Break-even yields. 
So this is a bit different concept to what we're, we're thinking of. And this is uh, lo looking at what our target or average yields are as a percentage of our break-even yields. Um, obviously, over 100% is, is good. Uh, less than 100% means you're turning a loss. Um, so in this case, we're saying 40 bushel uh, canola uh, is just over 10% uh, of our break-even yields. Um, soybeans are just over 13%. So again, it's, it's a good way to, to assess how close we are in terms of break-even. Crop insurance, uh, this slide assumes 80% crop insurance coverage. I, I, I think that we should be looking at crop insurance as a value for money component. So this is almost looking at it as, as if it were uh, a hail insurance type program, comparing our premium with our coverage. Um, some of the things that we see here obviously are soybean premiums and the, the cost of coverage and the premium as a percentage of coverage, which is in the red line. Uh, soybeans and corn are expensive compared to the other crops. Uh, mainly canola and uh, wheat. Um, generally, that's because there's when there's a loss, there's a bit more of a loss. The dollar value, especially in corn, is higher to insure. So it's it's a good uh, uh, quick assessment of the cost of risk for us. Again, another agri insurance slide looking at our 80% coverage and where we're covered. Um, we're looking at covering all of our operating costs, between 130 and 160% of our operating costs, but only three quarters to 90% of our total costs on our farm are covered. Different producers have different liabilities. D different producers are in different stages of the game within their crop uh, and their farming careers. Younger farmers obviously carry more risk. Uh, uh, Well-established, high equity farmers have a little less at risk, but you know, the one thing that they do have is they do have equity to preserve, especially when they're going into retirement or, or transferring the farm to the next generation. So we always always advise our clients, remember, ensure, ensure your liabilities and, and knowing how much of your costs are covered. Next slide here is cost not covered. By insurance, I always like to look at this to see what costs aren't covered. And as we can see, the red is the fixed costs within our farm. The green is the labor cost. So again, all of our operating is covered, which is good. But to different levels, fixed is not covered. And we do have some dollars on the table that aren't covered by agri insurance or crop insurance. Okay, so this is a uh, risk reward. Um, I've really been pushing this with the, the clients that I advise. And, and probably the easiest way to grasp this is, is a bit of an analogy. If I was to tell you there's two lotteries that you can enter into, both are million dollar lotteries. One sells 100 tickets, the other one sells 1,000 tickets. Which one would you take? Probably the 100 ticket one, right? Better chance of winning. Well, with that though, we don't really have all the information. And often that's the case when we look at crop profitability, just straight up on profitability. We don't have all the information. How about if I was going to go and tell you now that with those tickets, the 100 ticket lottery, it's 500 grand a ticket, and the 1,000 ticket lottery, it's $50 a ticket. What would you do now? Well, you'd probably go to that 1,000 ticket lottery at 50 bucks because it's more affordable, you don't have as much to lose, and there's still generally a decent chance of winning. Well, this is what risk and reward essentially is with, with our crops and, and one way that we should be assessing what crops we grow initially and then once the cedar has uh, done its job, what our investment decisions are throughout the growing season uh, in terms of risk and reward. So a, a, f a few things to pull out of this one, um, looking at canola and soybeans, we have pretty decent reward being the blue bars. And the green line is the percent of, of coverage on our, on our crop insurance. Uh, we, so we still have pretty decent coverage levels. Obviously, the higher the green line, the higher the blue line, the higher the green line, the better it is for everyone. The green line is your coverage again. Blue, the blue bars are your return or your reward. Um, 
barley, unfortunately, and, and our projections doesn't uh, fare very well at all. Uh, but one thing I, I'd want to point uh, as a comparison is uh, hard red spring wheat and northern hard red uh, wheat. Um, the, the northern wheat under these, under these numbers show a very good reward, a lot more reward than the hard red spring, and only a little bit less risk. So this is just one of the points to pull out. And these are using our numbers. Of course, your numbers are more important than my numbers. But it's a good way to start comparing the different crops. Uh, I understand a lot of us are rotationally bound uh, by, by our cropping decisions, but we always do have swing acres and we're always making decisions what to keep, what to, what to get rid of the rotation. I encourage you to look at how much reward am I getting as a percentage of, of your investment and then how much risk do I have. I, I think it's a good, a good starting point and a good discussion point. So that, that was uh, looking at it uh, from a, a, a little bit global perspective. Let's, let's boil this down. Let's go back into that cost of bushel sold. And you're going to say, you know what, Darren, I'm tired of you saying cost of bushel sold, but I'm going to hammer this thing and hammer it and hammer it and hammer it because I think it's so important. So we're going to just look at canola and we're going to walk through this one. So if we're looking at uh, uh, the blue bar being the coverage, and we're looking at about $325 of coverage uh, with 80% crop insurance. We're using our 40 bushel target yield. That gives us about $8, just over $8 per bushel of coverage on our 40 bushel crop that we're growing. So that's what we have insured. That's the risk-free uh, portion of that bushel, if you were, that we have. Stepping it through. The red bar are the risks not covered by insurance. So essentially, if we go back to our break-even cost, our total break-even costs are $10.20 per bushel. Uh, we take away the $8.08 .08 per bushel of coverage, and we're left with about $2, just over $2 of exposed risk as uh, we say the uh, assets uh, flapping in the wind, so to speak. That is what is at risk within this crop of canola. So, so we know what's covered, we know what's at risk. What about our profit? The, the last uh, portion here of profit, if we use our 1125, we're looking at just over a dollar a bushel of profit within this uh, example here. So it allows us to compare on a cost per bushel sold, how much coverage we have on a, on a per bushel, how much exposed risk, and then what our profit potential is, all on a cost per bushel sold. And I think it's, it's good to, to assess things uh, on your farm this way. Um, when we pull forward the other crops, it allows us to now compare the crops and start to see not only how much risk we have out there, um, also what the potential for reward is out there. And as you see, uh, depending on, on your risk preferences, uh, canola and soybeans still do have uh, a very uh, favorable mix when it comes to looking at our crop, our costs, our risk, and our reward this way. And again, the, the idea of the game is not only maximizing our profit, it's also minimizing our assets flapping in the wind, so to speak, to make sure that we, we can... Uh, we can keep this farm going year over year over year. Showed this slide a few minutes ago, again, just to compare what our profitability is uh, and where it is with the numbers that we've used in the sky. Uh, another thing that we will always uh, encourage our clients to do is a stress test. Um, I, I'm a big believer in saying, okay, well, you know, they, these are using our target yields again, which are probables plus 5% using uh, what we feel we can generate for new crop prices, what if, what if things don't work out? What if we see some changes in price? What if our price is down percent, 10% and yield is down 5%? What does that look like? Obviously, the more profitable crops do have a lot more resiliency and they don't have as much loss when it comes down to uh, having a, a stress test or a shock to the system. But I, I think it's good to do this assessment to see how these your different crops react to the stress test to see 
uh, if there's any uh, unpleasant hidden surprises that you might see should that happen. And of course, being in Manitoba, last few years have been pretty good throughout most or the better part of the province. There's always uh, something that happens somewhere, uh, and uh, I've, I've, I'm involved in a farm too, and I remember 2005 to 2011, and those are some really tough years where if we could say yield down 5%, we would take it. Uh, it's, it's good to know, again, where, where these crops are in terms of risk and profitability should a shock to the system happen. We've often seen, I'm shifting gears a little bit here, but still talking about risk, we've often heard about the seeding dates. Uh, MESC has some great data out there about the relative yield of different crops as the calendar rolls ahead uh, throughout the seeding season. Um, I was more interested in what our returns would look like, not so much what our relative yields would be. Um, and this graph is a great example of how, as the calendar moves along throughout the seeding season, what happens to our returns. Um, two things I want to point out on this one uh, would, be the, uh, would be the wheat, hard red spring wheat, and the canola. The hard red spring wheat drops fairly quick as the calendar moves along. Uh, what that tells me when I look at this is get the wheat in early. Canola seems to have a little bit more resiliency, and you can get into June, the end of the first week of June, June, whatever the case may be, and it still seems to hold its yield potential a little bit better. So I, I found this interesting to look at the seeding dates from an economic perspective and, again, realize how this assessment on, on risk. My colleagues, uh, Roy Arnott and Anastasia Kubinek, talk a lot about rotations and the benefit to rotations um, within our online uh, Excel uh, version of this document, you can put in the different crop rotations uh, on your farm and see if you can get a, a benefit to your superior crop management and get a yield bump. Uh, this example, the first one is a canola wheat rotation, and we can see here what the, the yields are. If we, if we uh, add some diversity to the rotation, obviously the the returns go up, the, the yields go up, so obviously then the returns go up. And again, even a more, uh, another example of another great diverse rotation, we're seeing returns of, th you know, three, nearly $400 uh, over what a, what a straight, say, wheat, 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 wheat rotation would be, and we're seeing a, a couple hundred dollars over a wheat canola rotation. So this is the, really demonstrates the benefit of rotations. The last one is uh, an example of uh, the, probably the most common rotation that we see in Manitoba with being the big three crops. So again, we can see as we add diversity to our crop rotation, we do have a lot of benefits to, to our bottom line. Rent. Rent. The, so I, I get a huge amount of calls on rent, both from producers and from landlords. And I guarantee you to be wrong in this presentation. I see rents all over the board. I need to travel 10 minutes, and I can see $35 rents, and I can see $110 rents within my area. Um, the rents across the province vary widely. Uh, more what I'm going to be talking about today is, is ways for you to calculate your rents, things for you to think about when it comes down to rent. Um, often we see rents be around 18 to 22 percent of gross revenue, uh, something that we've often seen, but that's fine. But at the end of the day, with rents, we should be worried about profit, not about a percentage of gross revenue or, or, or even what the markets are, rent rates are, are dictating that we pay. We should always have that profit in mind. So, one quick way to look at this, very simply, is take our gross revenue minus all of our costs, and this is the cash available for rent. Keep in mind, though, one huge important consideration with this, there is no profit expectation within this. This is strictly how much do I have available for rent. I, I think doing it this way, and when we start determining how many dollars per acre we can look at rent, and then we can start to see well, if I'm going to pay that, 
and I don't have a profit expectation in there, I'm running my equipment essentially for free, and I'm just turning over stuff just to farm this, this land. And I think having and I, seeing what the margins are and seeing what your profit expectations are out of this, this land, I think it's, it's, it's somewhat sobering in, in how we determine our rent. So, and again, this is using our gross revenue. So what do we see here? So using the numbers within our guides, using our cost structure, and again, keeping in mind that these numbers are based on a target yield, which is probable yield plus 5%, I'd probably suggest you look at your long-term averages rather than a target when you're determining these numbers. But we start to see a range of, of how much money is left over, again, before any profit is taken out of those acres, and how much cash is there. And we see a range of 77 to $114 per acre for the big three crops. These numbers are very sensitive. Uh, using today's new crop prices, backing off the crop prices about 50 cents a bushel, it lowers things down to 30, 38 to $95 an acre, 38 being wheat, 95 being soybeans. So that's why it's important to keep on top of this. So 50 cent, 60 cents a bushel softening in the prices does have a huge impact of what's left over before profit for this land. So it's just, it's just important to, to keep that out, keep that in mind. So looking at this, where does this compare with our 18 to 22%? So we got the big three crops here. Uh, we can see the 18 to 22% range, and we can obviously see the green being the rent, with the, the red being the what's left over, or, or the profit amount. We can see a range here. And 18% for canola is 81 bucks an acre, uh, leaving a profit of 26. 22% for canola is $99 an acre, leaving a profit of only $8 an acre. So I mean, $8 an acre to invest all that risk, it's uh, not something that uh, not everyone would do. And it, it gets to have that, we get into that discussion of risk versus reward. How much, how much money we're risking versus how much money we're getting out of it. Uh, one thing we can see on the hard red spring wheat that at the 22% we're, we're actually losing money with that in mind. So this one, uh, this, this here is we're going back to the maximum available for rent at the blue bars. And what we see here are our, our lines. Uh, the bottom line is the green line is 18%. So we're taking all three crops here, because of course you don't say, okay, I'm going to grow soybeans for three years on a three-year rent. Uh, it's going to be soybeans every year. We have our crop rotation in there, so we've got to make sure we, we uh, take in all the crops that we grow on that land. So if we're growing our three crops here, we're looking at an 18% uh, share, um, and, to, and the black line is the average amount. The, the red line is the 22% share. So we can start to see how how we rank in how much money we have available for rent versus using that 18 to 22 percent amounts. And just as a, as a note here, uh, for the most part, uh, the crops still still profit except for wheat. Uh, wheat uh, caps out at that 18 percent, and if we use that black line, the average, we're losing money when we're growing wheat, um, and and the red line, we're, we're losing a lot of money. If we use today's value. We're, we're looking at rent between 70 to 86 dollars, uh, being the uh, 70 being the 18 percent, the 86 being the 22 percent, with an average just over 72 dollars using today's prices. So we, again, we can see a softening of those prices really do affect what's left over for us and what we're able to pay for rent. And obviously, rents are, are determined on a market basis. Um, I can say. This is, this is what my returns are, but the market rules today in, in, in capturing rents. But I think it's important for us to look inwardly to, to do this assessment and decide how much rent we can pay and, and what's good for our business. Uh, just just as, a, as a word of note as I close out my presentation here, there, the landlords often look at their, their land as an investment. So you'll see $2,800 an acre. That's a roughly average price for, for cropland within the province. Uh, there's a huge range on this. I'm not going to 
say that there isn't, uh, but what landowners will often look at is they'll say, well, my land is worth roughly this amount per acre. If I'm going to uh, get a return, and we're using 2.75%, but, you know, 2.5%, whatever the case may be, uh, and I've, I have to pay my uh, property taxes, what, I'm, what am I looking at? And, and landowners often do this calculation, and this example comes out to $92 an acre. So this is often a uh, way a landowner looks at it, and it's a bit of a check and balance. Uh, and, and we see that th this number is fairly close to the numbers that we've determined with the, the other method, the gross uh, revenue re method. So I, I think it's a good check and balance, and, and I think it's, it's good for, for us to be looking at it this way too, because we definitely guaranteed if you're in negotiations with a landlord, they will be looking at this and looking at what their returns are. Uh, closing out the presentation, we have an awesome tool called Crop Plan. Essentially, it contains all of our crop cost production data. It's in an Excel format, easy to use. You can come up with these numbers uh, for profitability fairly quickly. All of our costing data is, is backloaded uh, into, the, into the program. You can overwrite all of our numbers with your own numbers, which we highly recommend that you do, but at least allows you to determine the profitability fairly quickly. And with the risk reward and the assets flapping in the wind slide that you've seen earlier, we will be adding that feature into crop plan uh, over the next couple months here. It's, a, it's important, again, use your own numbers and, and profitability and prosperity doesn't just happen. You have to plan for it. We have a number of uh, worksheets and, and software on our website. Uh, please uh, uh, grab them. There's some real good ones there, some, some pretty simple ones, there's some pretty complex ones, and we, we encourage our, our uh, clients to, to look there. So take-home messages. I, I have a colleague who says, okay, well, that's fine. You've talked for a long, long, long time now, and now I've just woke up. What are you telling me that I need to do? What do I need to take home? And these statements sound super obvious, they, they sound almost simplistic, but they, they, are, they hold water. They're, they're the, the golden rule when it comes to, to profitability within the farm. And those who produce the most, more than likely, overwhelmingly, profit the most. You need a crop to sell, obviously. Uh, the more accurate your own numbers are, the more likely you are to obtain your, your profitability numbers and achieve success. We've often talked about profitability and rewards within these crops, but knowing the risks within these crops are equally important, and we need to be able to quantify those with our coverages and to know how much money is at risk. I always advise our clients that before you seed, compare the different crops. But once you've spoken with your seeder and the crops in the ground, and as the year goes on, update these numbers, no, keep on top of things, and if those opportunities exist, you can make spending decisions or investment decisions on, on extra chemical, late fertilizer application, fungicide, those types of things, or you can decide, you know what, the, the, the profitability is not there, we've got to keep our, our wallet in our pocket. Always keep on top of those numbers. That closes out my presentation. I think I got like one or two minutes for questions. Uh, I, again, will be at our Mantle Bear Culture booth this afternoon in the curling rink. So if you've got any questions, uh, feel free to pull me aside there. Um, is there any quick questions? Well, with that, I want to say thank you and enjoy your eight days experience. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Manitoba Ag Days podcast. We'll see you next year from January 22nd to 24th, 2019.